Accra, Ethiopia. As many of you know, it's a famous city within that region, a famous ritual and ceremonial and religious center within that region. And 25 years ago, myself on the left, the gentleman on the middle, and the gentleman Sagai Hailu on the right, had the privilege of helping found the Denver Oxum sister city relationship. So many of you know, but some of you don't know, the Denver has a very strong relationship to Tigray through the Oxum sister city. And in honor of that relationship, they named one of the central streets of Oxum, Denver Street. Quite an honor for our city. And uh, it was so pleasing to those of us at that time. By way of setting the stage on this same street in November of 2020, hundreds of people were massacred during the recent atrocities. Many people died and were killed on Denver Street. This is what the town of Oxum looks like vis-a-vis -vis its monuments and obelisks, which date back nearly 2,000 years. Near this church, St. Mary of Zion Church, a major religious center in Northern Ethiopia, is a small chapel where folks say that the lost Ark of the Covenant rests. And when I was there, I chatted with the priest Abe Tespamerium, who claimed to be guarding the Ark so nobly. I wonder if he's still guarding it today. I wonder if that little chapel still exists after what's happened recently. I'm not sure. Here are some of our Tigrayan friends at work in the markets of Tigray. And one of our DU students who joined me on that project several years ago on community development. Those are the real people that we're concerned about. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, Peter, that was very helpful. I don't think I've ever seen pictures from Tigray in that detailed manner, thank you. Um, I'll ask a few questions to our panel for, for us to get going and uh, for them to tell us a little bit about what they think caused the conflict, what led to the conflict from their disciplinary, but also um, their personal experience. And we'll start with Shamilis. All right, <clears throat> thanks so much, Abby, uh, Peter, for joining me. Thank you everyone uh, for attending and I sincerely appreciate your time. Um, I think the events that led up to this conflict, it's a long one, uh, we don't have time. Uh, as Abby alluded earlier, um, the offensive, the prime minister <coughs> of Ethiopia, Dr. Abiy Ahmed, uh, you know, declared uh, what prompted that offensive. We have to, you know, answer that first. The short answer, the short answer is on November 3, in the middle of the night, the Tigrayan People Liberation Front went into these five military bases and attacked hundreds, thousands of military men and women and ruthlessly massacred and killed innocent men and women while in their sleep. Then as any <laughs> head of state, you would have to ask, you know, you can't just sit idle and uh, let this be, um, you know, un unanswered, right? And you will also have to ask, why do the TPLF do this? What prompted them? I think that is also a very reasonable question. What is their end game? Why would they do that? There is a long history behind it. Yes, some of it, as Avi alluded, it's some political tensions. And to briefly give you a quick rundown, rundown of this event that led up to this conflict, the TPLF you know, 
do, in a very ruthless and dictatorial fashion, ruled the country from two, 1991 to 2018. So after a bitter infighting within the EPRD, the government is called Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, EPRD. It's a coalition of the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, the Amhara, the Oromo, and the Southern People. So while the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front are the minority, they bent everything to their favor. They control pretty much everything. So between 2015 and 2018, there was this huge simmering discontent in the public that you know, erupted through mass protests. And that led to the resignation of the prime minister at the time, Prime Minister Haile Mariam de Sali. So as I said, after that, you know, bitter infighting within the APRDF, Dr. Abiy Ahmed emerged as the prime minister of Ethiopia. So when right to four years to this day, when he was sworn in in the parliament, when he delivered the speech, he apologized for all the wrongdoings. EPRDF, remember, Abi himself is within the EPRDF. The transfer of power was peaceful, although there were some infightings, but this is not lost on TPLF. They were not happy. Why? Abi moved very, very fast on the reform agenda he promised. And he normalized the relations with the Eritreans. <clears throat> so I think the end game, as many Ethiopians, good willing Ethiopians, remember again, Tigrans, you cannot separate Tigrans from Ethiopian history. That picture, the Aksum, a little farther you know, down, there is a city called Adwa. Ethiopians in, in 1896, March, you probably know the Adwa victory, right? All Ethiopians from all walks of life, right? Marched there to you know, repel the Italian aggression and defeated one of the most really successful battles in the history of the black continent in Africa. So we cannot separate Tigray and Ethiopia. Tigray is not, it is a regional state. It's part of Ethiopia. And everybody cares about Tigray, including the prime minister. That's my personal belief. So that is the context. From disciplinary perspectives, obviously, I think I can, you know, my background is in information science. I understand social media. I understand what it means to communicate, messaging, sound bites. But it is, you know, I would be very, very candid with you all here. While we are here in front of these pioneers in international diplomacy, you know, international law, this school, that produced so many of them, right? The, so the point I'm making is, if constitutional order matters, if violence is not condoned, right? If the rule of law matters, whether it, you are in a rich country or a poor country, we have to speak in the same tone and voice and consistently, right? And the information science part is, from State Department to mainstream media, to the White House, to the European Union, to all development agencies, and folks that the TPLF, because of their 28 years of power, that they have transplanted into an international organizations, the poster child of whom, who is the, the, the Director General Theodros, the WHO Director, who, you know, sabotaged while they were the aggressors, they flipped the coin and made the Ethiopian government as the aggressor and killing and all what have you. So I think this relentless and really non-stop attack and twisting of the facts and how the sound bites has been you know, transferred from one corner to another and how the image of the Ethiopian army, I want to confess, and I would be happy to argue with anyone, 
Ethiopians are religious people, whether they are Christians or Muslims. Yes, there are some bad actors in the military and the government is indicting and prosecuting them as we speak, more than 50 of them. But in general, all these horrific things that you see the Ethiopian National Defense Force did, are, I, I won't buy it. Why? Because that, you know, Christianity, you go and read the National Geographic survey of 300,000, you know, people across the world and in terms of religion, Ethiopia ranks. I mean, the point I mean, I'm making here is that moral compass is still built into Ethiopia, Ethiopian society. And you have to also understand when the Eritrean army attacked Tigray in 1998, when that war erupted, it is these same forces that are stationed in these five bases who went on and defended Tigray. So I think the end game for, again, I'll circle back to why they started that. It is clear. And you saw it this last fall too. They were very inching towards Addis. Why? They want to come back to power. They want to reassert their dominance. But Ethiopians said, let's live in equality, in justice. Let's bygones be bygones. No one wanted to prosecute the wrongdoings of anyone. Yes, there were some folks that the government is trying to arrest that the TPLF shielded. So I think I want to stop here, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, thank you so much. Could you clarify just a little bit more who was doing the killing that we saw on CNN and BBC and all these people? Because you, that was reported as the, the Ethiopian army, Ethiopian, that was not the Ethiopian army. Could you just clarify on that? Okay, very, very good, valid question, right? Um, I'm not in any way saying people didn't die. Mm -hmm. Yes, people died. It's an active war, right? Mm -hmm. But the assertion that the military went on house to house and intentionally and deliberately killed innocent Tigrans is false. Mm -hmm. You can go to, to, to Tigray today, and it took them three weeks to march to Tigray after that offensive with little army that is left in the South, the government marshaled and marched to Tigray and to control the capital city of Mekele. It took them three weeks, but people died in the process. Absolutely, both sides. I am not condoning war, really. Uh, war is horrible. Mm -hmm. So I think we will get to that, but obviously people died. Uh, and you will have to also ask, you know, the others, this is a vicious cycle of, violence mm -hmm. between brothers really and sisters between people of same culture and religion so yes but i think this is orchestration the international humanitarian organization the mainstream media are working in tandem trust me this is true and there are only sound bites i think from the uh, you know my information science background i will only leave you with these questions who is the expert? Who is the authority? What is fact? What is truth, mm -hmm. right? We have to dwell on all of these things, honestly. And when you are only asking white Europeans or Americans, right? In mainstream media who are maybe based in compromised at best in Nairobi without stepping foot, yes, the government has blocked access initially for security reasons, but there are also folks who traveled to that region and documented what has happened, really. So I think, you know, if whatever we see on CNN is believable, I highly doubt it. Thank you. Um, Peter, did you want to add to those sentiments yes. from a human rights perspective? Yes. I appreciate Shamelis's very articulate presentation. I agree with some of his points and disagree profoundly with some of his other points, but that's okay. It's a challenging, as he says, a challenging environment. And I appreciate his, his, uh, his points, even though I disagree with some. Let me uh, say that uh, from a human rights perspective, and I realize all three of us here care about human rights, that's for sure, as do everyone else in this room, um, we have some concerns. Uh, with the large number of displaced people that Abby alluded to in her introduction, several hundred thousand perhaps, we don't have exact numbers. 
and of course refugees that fled from Tigray, uh, various directions, but certainly into Eastern Sudan. Uh, when I spoke to a young lady who had just come back from that area, she estimated, a uh, Tigrayan American lady, she estimated about, from what she heard from the camps there, of 30 to 50,000. Now this is last year, the numbers of course, vary and change, I realize that there may be less there now, there may be more there now, but refugee flight has been significant. That's a human rights issue, of course. Um, there are four provision rights that underplay, underlay and underplay all other rights. The provision rights are what allow people to survive. And those provision rights are water, sanitation, shelter and food. If you don't have those, you can't do much in other areas that you might care about, like speaking out, freedom of speech, and many other things that we all care about. All four of those provision rights have been severely disrupted in Tigray because of the fighting and because of everything else that's happened, some of which Shamelis alluded to. So it's my view that Eritrean incursions and federal incursions into Tigray disrupted, and in some cases purposely disrupted, all four of those systems, if we can call them systems, water, sanitation, shelter, and food. And of course, we're particularly concerned about food. Many people have starved. I talked directly to people who've come back from that region, including two recently, to gray and American ladies. People are starving. And may I say, Shamelis, we again don't want to stereotype, certainly not, you don't want to, Abby doesn't, I don't. But I specifically talked to a young lady who talked to people in her home village where military had slaughtered innocent Tigrayan people. That happened. She talked to the people. It happened to their family members. So certainly those atrocities occurred. Um, that's the background. We can debate among good folks, many of the other issues. But to me, that's the underlying human rights issue, Abby, those four provision rights that have been so severely disrupted. And then of course we can talk about other strategies and whatnot. So thank you for that. Thank you, Peter. Yes. So we have issues uh, to talk about, especially in whose report should we believe? You know, who killed those people? There's still the question on the table here because we are having mixed information. And the issue of human rights is very important. And we have seen that improving um, over the past uh, week or so because of the ceasefire and the truth. But if you could speak, uh, Shemilis and Peter, what are the issues here that we should uh, be looking at? What are the main issues that are influencing this fracture that has taken place between the government and the people? Like you did allude to some of them in your initial remarks, but if you can point to us, you know, like one or two things that we can, you know, come back to when we open up the discussion to the people in the audience. Thank you, Abby. Um, I think really the, so the sticking issues, as we call them, right? Um, this is my personal view. I would bet and argue with all of you, I would care for Tigrayan brothers and sisters more than probably anyone. My wife runs Ethiopian restaurant. Do you know who? Her employees are the grants. The last time I have been to Ethiopia, Addis, is this last December. When I took sabbatical in 2016, I went to Macaulay University with a professor from Germany to do workshops. These are brothers and sisters, but I think we have to put everything in context, honestly. So those are sticking issues. The Tigrayan people, we, you see, here is a thing. Violence by any means and form and shape should not be allowed, right? The Tigrayan People's Liberation Front should lay arms down. Should lay, that is, you know, they should lay arms down and come to the negotiating table. And something that would is missing in the international conversation is there is no war in Tigray today. In fact, since June 2021, after the government left, there is no war. Instead, it is the TPLF that is marching. So I think 
they have to stop, you know, they are not helping their own people, the, the people they say they represent, the people they say they are fighting for. So on the government side, <clears throat> there is this a new initiative on this national dialogue and uh, reconciliation and what have you. And the government has to allow this process, you know, in a more credible, transparent fashion and bring all parties, you know, in a very transparent way. So I think, you know, the issues, yes, I know, I mean, I, I can go on and on. TPLF will t tell you, Eritrean troops have to leave the country. If they are, I don't have the data, but they, I agree with that demand. The, grands, uh, the Eritrean army should not be within the Ethiopian territory, including in, Eritre in Tigray. They should leave the country, yes. But the, the other issue they will tell you is <clears throat> the government should restore service like banking, telecommunication, and what have you. And the government will in turn say, you have to recognize us. It is you who said, we don't recognize you. We don't re you know, take orders from you. And it would be very hard for the government to fulfill that in light of all this you know, uh, undermining uh, still going on. And the TPLF will bring this issue again, the question of Western Tigray. Probably you have heard in the latest um, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch joint report. What is Western Tigray? It's part of, you know, in the Northern area. This is, it is a very contested area. So I think that also has to be resolved in a peaceful political and diplomatic way. I can go on what is Western Tigray, what happened in Welkite, uh, you know, Humara area. Before the TPLF came to power in 1991, those Western Tigray areas used to be administered by a province called Bagembe, which is part of Amhara. And <clears throat> for some geopolitical, you can read even the latest Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, they have the statement to the effect, it is the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front that annexed that area. I mean, this is not about land grab by the Amharas or by this or by that. I think everybody should be allowed to live and work and raise family there, right? The question should be, okay, who should administer? If we are talking about federalism, self-ruling, self-governing, right? Who should be administering that? So I think that those are some of the sticking issues, the question of Western Tigray, laying down arms, and also I think the government doing its best to facilitate this credible national dialogue. Uh, it's not just hand, if there are opposition parties are, you know, this contesting about the formation, the process within which the commissioners were set up, the commission is set up to facilitate this dialogue. So the, the government, this is a big chance and the government has to also take a very dramatic shift. You know, business as usual, let's go and fight and kill them or crush them is not really, the way to go forward. Uh, we, it has to come you know, to terms, okay, bring new perspectives, new you know, approaches. As I said, in the same manner, violence should not be allowed. It is from either side, right? So I think, um, you know, I don't know if I address those as a big sticking issues, mm -hmm. the question of Western Tigray and the um, laying down arms by the TPLF that probably they may not say, um, they may not agree to. Mm -hmm and restoring services and what have you. Thank you. Peter, did you want to add yes. from the human rights? Thank you. Thank you, Shamelis, for those points. And I certainly agree with your points about governmental structure, proper management, ways to move forward so that peace can be attained in the future. And looking at the various structures, we have to absolutely, as you say. Uh, it's very interesting to note among the many players in this conundrum, we have the Eritrean troops, Federated Ethiopian troops, the Tigrayan troops, Amhara troops and militias, and then other various militias. Uh, one of my friends re referred to some of the ragtag militias which exist and have been at odds with others in that whole region. There's a lot of forces at play here. It's not just simply two sides, as you can see. Let me add to that 
something interesting as we move toward hopefully <laughs> resolution of this crisis in the future. The Oromo Liberation Army, which is a significant army, is on the move. And it's not formally aligned with Tigray people. It's not formally aligned with the president of the country. It's not easily aligned with many of the other factions at play in Ethiopia, but it's a powerful force. Oromo people constitute a major majority in Ethiopia among the ethnic groups. As Shemelis correctly pointed out earlier, the Tigrayans are a small minority. If you look at the um, numbers roughly of 115 million Ethiopian people, Tigrayans are only about 7 million, a small minority as Shemelis pointed out, yet has been prominent in political affairs. So that has to be considered. The other thing I wanna mention in this context, and I'm an anthropologist, not a political scientist, but Ethiopia has a type of federated structure that is supposed to respect various ethnic groups in a semi-autonomous or quasi-autonomous fashion, yet still respect the fact that they're all Ethiopians. This plays out, again, as Shemelis correctly pointed out earlier, uh, in several ways as we think about who is an Ethiopian person. All these people are Ethiopian persons, absolutely. I've recently been in Southwest Ethiopia in the nationalities zone. This is a different area. This is where many tribal people, famous tribal people in the Omo River Valley and others live. Very different from the Amhara, the Tigrayan, the Oromo and other people that we're talking about. These tribal people, also Ethiopians, have very different issues. I remember speaking to a Suri judge, to a Ma'en health worker, to a Dizzy citizen. He wasn't Dizzy, the name of his tribe is Dizzy. He was not Dizzy at all. <laughs> Talking to those tribal people in re relatively remote Southwest Ethiopia, their issues are quite different than the issues that we're talking about here, yet they count, of course, as Ethiopians too. So long and short, this is a complex country with a federated structure, which has some pluses, and in my view, some minuses as it tries to deal with all this. And that's part of also what we're dealing with as we move forward. My final point about on the, back to the humanitarian slash human rights point, uh, Abby, I believe what we've seen in the last year and a half is what we might call a siege, a kind of siege and a kind of siege mentality. And I believe what's happened and happening in Tigray is ethnocide. I believe it's ethnocide. Thank you, Peter. Those are um, very sticking points that you bring out because um, we still had debated exactly how to um, call the, 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 the human rights abuses that have ha happened in the region. And uh, thanks for bringing that to the fore. Wow. There's a lot that we have unpacked so far, and I know that you are eager to ask questions, but I have uh, just one more thing that I want us our, our, our panelists to address is like, okay, we have all these issues coming up and we have all these uh, you know, challenges within the country. What are some of the things you can recommend in terms of going forward and building lasting peace for uh, the, the region of Tigray, Ethiopia as a whole, because you also bring in other tribes that or other ethnic groups that uh, seem not to be, you know, um, imp high, heavily impacted by this, but they're impacted by other issues that pertain to their, you know, uh, state or country where they live. And so, what are some of the things that we can look for? And uh, hoping that um, the African Union, the AU, I mean, the, the UN would, you know, pick up on those things. And we'll come back. Uh, later to just talk more broadly in terms of um, how these external actors and particularly the UN and the AU have addressed the issue in the Tigray region. Thank you, Abby, again. Um, <clears throat> one quick uh, you know, uh, thing that I, I'm not in agreement with Peter, uh, the Oromo Liberation Army, um, by the way, they have publicly declared uh, their uh, you know, alliance with the TPLF. You know when they did that? When they were marching to Addis. How many of you have heard the Tigrayan People Liberation Front were close to Addis Ababa, mm -hmm. right? This last fall. Mm -hmm. And when the earlier East Africa envoy from the State Department 
uh, I think Ambassador Fentman, mm -hmm. when he was in Addis, on the same day, the former ambassador of Ethiopia to the US, at EPLF, at Graham, and other groups met in, our, in Washington, DC, creating a government in the waiting. And former diplomats all were, you know, this is a public record, you can go and find it out. Even before their Zoom virtual meeting called Pentagon, what sorts of assistance they would get. Now, the, you know, the Oromo Liberation Army and TPLF are marching to Addis. How can we resolve? They, you know, <clears throat> moved out all their stuff, right? Uh, people fled, uh, except the Ethiopians. So I think that I would disagree in that. Uh, they are working hand and glove. Uh, so coming to the solution, really, um, especially with the uh, United Nations African Union, the IGAD, this intergovernmental authority in the East Africa region, it's an economic and development block. All of them have to use their lever, including European Union, China, the US especially, uh, have to use their lever in its, in a, and channel it in a proper fashion to put the pressure where the pressure is due. That is a TPLF. The government is elected democratically, whether you like it or not, I think that is a debate. Uh, and we have to understand democracy is very messy. We know what has happened here in, on January 6. It is very fragile. After 200 plus years of democratic exercise in this country, we always say, right, you know, towards a perfect union. That's what we talk about, right? So instead they use their lever and you know put maximum pressure on TPLF to come to the negotiating table, lay down their arms, and the government also um, you know open up negotiating good faith and if need be uh, you know release some of the the TPLF friends they have already started. I know this is you know to contrary to the Ethiopian public that I am saying. Ethiopians were so furious because the government started to release some of those TPLF, you know, powerful officials uh, this last uh, December. So I think all these, you know, international organizations have to use uh, their lever leverage and um, really bring the, these warring parties to the negotiating table. The only solution in, in the end, obviously, as we know, is um, political and diplomatic solution. War is not the solution. This is a vicious cycle of violence between brothers and sisters. That has to stop. And the government also has to, as I said earlier, I'm very critical of the government. As much as I support this government, because you know, it is, you know, this is the international community. When you see a budding, a fledgling democracy, we need to support it. We need to, we do, we do not stand in the way and abort that, you know blossoming democratic exercise. So I think instead we need to acknowledge the government. It is elected by the people and what the government has done. I didn't go into so there's so many reforms and uh, you know releasing of political prisoners, all of them, how you know folks who were sentenced to death in absentia were also came back home because of this new government. I didn't go into all of those. That should be encouraged. And then we should ask for more similar uh, you know, exercise. So I think um, that, that is obviously, again, the political and diplomatic solution uh, that should be prime and center. Mm -hmm. And these international actors has, has to also, you know, instead of putting this pressure um, and um, on the government only, right? Um, the TPLF is not a saint. When they marched to Addis, what they did in Amhara and Afar, do you know they, are, they still control and wage war in Afar in five districts? They still are there. Do you know why they are not, uh, this siege mentality, I do not subscribe to it. They want to do this, my personal assessment, because I can understand the psyche of that country, right? They want to maintain their relevance. If they succumb to this, you know, negotiations and Abiy is still in power, 
they would probably be you know, forgotten, I don't know. Um, so they still want to assert their relevance and prominence and they want to create all kinds of chaos. I mean, the UN, Ethiopia office, how many out of 400 some trucks were, that went into Tigray, how many came back? All this siege, while there is active war, they are waging, the, they are shelling towns in Amhara and, and um, in Afar, I think it is very, very difficult. So I think uh, uh, in the end, uh, you know, uh, the political and diplomatic solution should be the way forward. <laughs> Let me just add a bit to that, uh, especially with regard to the role of the African Union and the RECs that, that's at regional economic groups, particularly EGAD and East African mm -hmm. Community. There is a gap here that like you rightly point out, there was need to be able to speak to the Ethiopian government in particular. And what the Ethiopian crisis has really shown is a lack of um, involvement from top political diplomats at the AU, right? So the AU has worked very hard over the years to create the African peace and security architecture to address some of these crises. But it appears uh, at the start of this crisis, the AU was taken by surprise. So one of the architecture, the architecture is made up of uh, four or five parts. We have the Peace and Security Council. That is the um, 15 member um, state uh, members to the, to the Peace and Security Council. And they are the ones who make decisions when to intervene, you know, what crisis to address. And then we have uh, the, what we call a, um, a continental early warning system that is theoretically supposed to warn, you know, heads of states in African elites on these issues. So, and then we have what we call the panel of the wise. These are eminent members within the continent that have been selected uh, based on their diplomatic credentials over the years. And we have the peace fund. And however, when the conflict started, the African Union Commission, Chairperson Musafaki, did not say anything about this. The African Union Chairperson at that time was Cyril Ramaphosa, did not say anything about it. And so the crisis continued and what we saw was um, him, instead of addressing the crisis in Tigray, he first addressed the crisis between Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt about over the Nile River waters when people were already dying in the Tigray region. So it appears that the, the Grand Renaissance Dam was easier for them to address than the crisis. And you might ask why that, why is that is the case? I mean, the influence, first of all, that Ethiopia wields in Addis is significant. And so it appears the instrument of peace and security that have been put by the continent to address such crisis did not work because Ethiopia is a regional power and it hosts the African Union. So that is where the gap is in terms of realizing um, lasting peace for the, for, the, for the country because they need to overcome the influence that the Ethiopian government, for example, wields. They should be able to send envoys to, to talk to uh, whoever is in, in power in the Ethiopian government and also when they finally did something about it, when Cyril Ramaphosa then, who was the AU chair, decided to do something about it, he appointed three former heads of states, um, Ellen Salif Johnson, Kalema Matlante, and uh, Chisano from Mozambique, right? These are not part of the, uh, the panel of the wise. So that further undermines the mechanism that the continent has created to be able to address such issues. So. I do agree with you that there is really something that has to be done for um, the instruments that have been created at the continental and regional level to address peace and security, but also the AU needs to overcome the power that the Ethiopian government wields uh, in terms of influencing its decisions. There are many things that are, are still not done because um, Ethiopian government has not um, said yes. For example, the issue of Somalia, nobody talks about the issue of Somalia because they know Ethiopia is going to reject that. You know, this, it's a non-issue. Similarly, they took the similar approach with the Tigrayan region. They knew that 
uh, Ethiopia was going to say no. And he and Ami um, Abi Ahmed did say no when the envoys arrived. Say, well, this is uh, a law enforcement issue, and so we are going to take it up ourselves. We are not going to accept any diplomatic, external diplomatic uh, efforts. And so that died down, which undermines the whole security architecture. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that, Abby. That was a very profound and, in my view, accurate interpretation. It builds on what all of us are saying here about the challenges. Um, we talk about institutional challenges, don't we? And much of what we're talking about is institutional, but there are individual challenges and individuals stand out, of course. Um, and we just mentioned some, Abby just mentioned some individuals. Um, I mentioned the individual approach as we established the Denver Oxum sister city 25 years ago, you know, individuals stood up and stood forward. Uh, interestingly, did you know that Abi Ahmed had family members right here in Denver several years ago? Yeah, in the Denver Aurora area, another tie to Denver. Interesting. On the individual level, we haven't addressed what many of us think is the ominous relationship between Abi Ahmed and Isaias Afwerki, the president slash dictator of Eritrea. Uh, most of us who've studied what he's done and talked to Eritrean people over the years, many of whom have been refugees, many of you know that refugees fl fleeing across the Mediterranean in recent years, many of those have been fleeing from Eritrea. That country, relatively small country, of course it used to be a part of Ethiopia, that country has a conscriptive army and for its size has one of the largest armies in the world for its size. Women and men, conscripted in, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think any of us here are defending the Eritrean army, but I'm just simply saying you need to know that Abi and Afwerki brokered an agreement. That was part of the reason that Abi won the Nobel Peace Prize. I think that was a mistake to award that to him. That's just my personal opinion. In any event, there's the continued relationship with a dictator who in part, in my view, and in the view of a number of my other colleagues who are both Ethiopian and non-Ethiopian, that relationship compounds everything else that we're trying to do here. And some of the issues that Abby has also just recently addressed about the challenges of moving forward. Um, thank you so much. I think I have a, a little bit of slight different take here. Um, I'm not in any way condoning Isaias of Eritrea. He has to defend for himself and he rec his record speaks for itself, right? Um, but countries have interest, right? Alliances, you know, if you ask me an honest <laughs> question, if you need honest answer, the US should be the first one to condemn Saudi Arabia and it shouldn't be a friend to Saudi Arabia at all. Why would you know the U.S. embrace Saudi, the Saudi? And for example, you see, this is where the international community, the West, now is coming to surface between Russia and Ukraine, right? The global South is silent. Why? You see, this is utter hypocrisy of the West and the international community is not helping honestly speaking. If you go to Ethiopia, I can speak for Ethiopia or Africa even in general. If you ask citizens, who do you choose? Democracy, the West or the East? They're, I'll tell you at least for Ethiopia, they will say democracy and the West or the US. Ethiopia is, you know, 100 years of diplomatic relationship with the US. It's one of those ancient countries. But I think we need to, you know, <clears throat> respect we shouldn't dictate, we shouldn't say, we know best for you. You shouldn't be a friend to this person that or that person. Do you know that EPLF launched missiles to Asmara? Do you know hundreds of thousands of innocent Ethiopians and Eritreans died in what is being characterized here in mainstream media? Two bold men like me fighting over a comb. What, what happened? Why did that happen? You see, I think, honestly, as I said in the beginning, my, in my beginning remark, <clears throat> if we really, really are serious about human life, 
whether it is brown, white, black, what have you, right? We should be consistent. And all other things being aside, <clears throat> what Abi did normalizing this no peace, no war relationship for 20 years. The, it was <clears throat> in the, you know, the AU led arbitration that contested area is awarded to Eritrea. And the TPLF said, no, they may have other explanations, which I will not go into. But regardless, in his very first address to the parliament, Abi said, I will go to Eritrea without any precondition and not create, you know, relationship, normalize our relationship. So I think he saw his, you know, okay, this geopolitical, you know, issue, the Nile being one, Sudan, Egypt, and the Red Sea, and all of that has to be also factored here. So where if Abi went there and created the relationship with um, Isaias, in so far as it is to, you know, for the interest of Ethiopia, let it be. I, my personal point, you know, the matter for, uh, you know, the, the, the nature of the dictatorship and whether to deal with Isaias or not has to be left to the Eritrean people, right? We can still be friends in so far as it serves our interest. You see, as I said, we do not, we cannot have this, you know, double standard uh, while the West is colluding and dining and working with dictators until they are no more relevant and say, why would you be a friend to Isaias? I think I don't buy that, uh, honestly. Um, I, I completely agree with you, uh, Abby, earlier. African Union, to it, throughout its it history, Organization of African Union before is ineffectual, to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, um, you know, they are doing their work properly. Um, even with that APSA, you talked about that security architecture. Mm -hmm. um, but regardless, it is time. Um, you know, they have to speak the truth and uh, play their, you know, critical role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they have successes in other places, but it just seems like they have challenges dealing with regional powers like Ethiopia and those powers that in you know, we would a lot more influence on the union. But I want to open it up to everybody in the audience and on online to or ask questions. Anybody want to go for yes, yeah, Susan? All right, Peter. Thank you, Suzanne. It was nice to see you today. And nice to see you again. Thanks for coming. Um, national dialogues are critical. Um, and in that regard, as we think about moving toward resolution, of course, um, I would like to point out that we still, in those dialogues, perhaps could frame them in terms of, uh, from a human rights perspective, distributive justice, which has to do with resources and the proper allocation and the equitable allocation of resources that can be considered through dialogue and through conversation. I think a distributive justice model might be helpful as a guide. Uh, I believe, of course, we look at the formal decision makers, but I think we also have to be sure to include informal decision makers from the communities the various communities and give them a chance to speak out, both men and women. You know, through the BITO and the other organizations that exist in Ethiopia, there's a strong history of women as co-leaders in dialogue and in decision-making. We have to have that and we'll have to have women and men, including informal decision-makers engaged in that type of discourse, in my opinion. And then the final thing I wanna say in that regard is that we still need to open up communication channels because as, as of this week, 
when I chatted with a colleague of mine in terms of whether he's still able to touch base with his family members in central Tigray after these many months, he is not. He is not able to make one cell phone call or internet connection after 18 months. That applies to many of the other colleagues. So back to discourse, we have to be sure that people in Tigray, and of course, elsewhere in that country, have communication so they can be a part of it. The communication channels are currently inadequate. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Suzanne. That is a very important question. And uh, I think if it is handled properly, absolutely, this is a venue. And we have, this is, you know, the window of opportunity is fast closing, right? Uh, the national dialogue is already formed. The commissioners are named. Uh, it is um, decreed uh, by the House of uh, Federation. So, but the opposition parties like the Oromo from the Somali uh, and the TPLF included are not, you know, on board to this. So I think, you know, what my plea to the government would be in order for the process to be, unless, you know, the process is free and fair, the outcome will not be free and fair. So the government has to step back and listen to the concerns and um, you know, the grievances of this opposition party and it has to be all inclusive, right? And I think um, it is time now to think differently and uh, maybe if need be reconstitute the commission to address the concerns of all these opposition uh, parties. You know, in my view, the Oromo Liberation Army, for example, they did so much horrible, gruesome, killings that I cannot even say it here. But for the purpose of peace and for people to live in harmony, we have to step back and you know, open that venue for people to come to terms. I sometimes go to what Colombia did, for example, with the park, that unique Christmas you know, <laughs> approach with artists, I, I've read, you know, I do read some international coverage. So I think we, we have to go beyond, you know, guns and battles and fighting. And I think this is absolutely a good time. And this is also where the international community should use their experiences like the US and the European Union and other development partners come to the fore and support to make this national dialogue a success. I couldn't agree more, particularly on the last point, but I want to open to another question. Is there anyone else? All right, uh, find out. Our mutual mentor. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, you see, it's a good start. By no means it is perfect, right? There is no perfect democracy. Um, but I think um, the representation, um, yes. You see here we have, um, when you take the Senate and the House, for example, there is that balance when we instead for larger states not to dictate what is going to happen all the time. 
we have also two equally elected right representatives maybe that kind of order is important i don't know uh, but i think the oromos are very well represented the oromo liberation army is fighting not because um they are not represented you see here is the thing Iteta is a multi-ethnic linguistic country there is no first and there is no second in Iteta. all these people the territory may have shrunk or expanded throughout thousands of years of its history but you know the idea that um you know that this ethnic representation is while it is important um, and i think we need to work through the system so the the, the, the point being really um i'm trying i'm losing my train of thought <clears throat> but i think uh, really re re that is also the sticking point now when you have you know for better or worse the federal arrangement is being done along ethnic lines when you have the crux of the matter is when you have some fringe elements that see their ethnic above their Ethiopian identity, right? This is what Abi wanted to break. You know, for the 28 years TPLF led, you know, reign in power, um, people have more allegiance to their ethnic group than to the national identity. So, it is, he's not doing away with the federal arrangement. <laughs> that is, Ethiopia is still expanding. Actually, more new statehoods are coming now. So I think the representation is there. It's not quite, um, you know, probably the way we like it. You know, I would argue, for example, to the people in the Omo region, the very, you know, disenfranchised and, um, uh, you know, in terms of economy, education, healthcare, and what have you, those should be, you know, brought or, and included and represented equally as well. Uh, we shouldn't only go there for their land, right? So yes, there is a work um, that needs to be done, uh, but I think um, overall, uh, you know, the, the, the fair between the upper and the lower house, the representation is based on the population size. And this would <laughs> down the road, my fear is would bring even now the discontent is now, you see, the resistance. Before it was the Tigrayans turn, now it is almost turn. That is the kind of discontent that you hear. But I think, you know, in order to avoid this majority uh, supremacy, right, all the time, uh, there should be some, you know, uh, checks and balances. Regardless, I think, you know, I'm repeating myself, there is a start, a good start. Um, the Oromos, according to their number and size, are represented, and uh, and I think what is now left out, obviously because of the war, is that the grants they should because after this peace, hopefully they will come to you know take their seat in the parliament. That is my hope. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Did you want to add, or should oh, we just take oh, other questions? Add one thing about just, the Congress. Congress. <laughs> I want to mention, speaking of Congress, um, in the U.S. Congress, some of you might know, there's been a Senate bill introduced recently, but I want to mention the House bill led by Representative Tom Malinowski of uh, New Jersey. And this uh, bill, H.R. 6600, is entitled the uh, Ethiopia Stabilization, Peace, and Democracy Act. And it addresses in part, or attempted to address in part, some of the very issues that we've discussed today. You can find it online, HR 6600, just introduced in February. But briefly, it's the policy of the United States to attack, uh, to address, excuse me, gross violations of human rights, including possible genocide, I'm summarizing now, to use all diplomatic, developmental, and legal tools to stabilize and help end the violence in Ethiopia and to support efforts to hold accountable those who committed gross violations of internationally recognized human rights, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and other atrocities in Ethiopia. And finally, I'm just summarizing the highlights, to promote an inclusive national dialogue. So that's the latest from our House of Representatives here. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so Singumbe and what's your name? Kelsey, Kelsey, do you want to go first then, Sinkumbe? We'll give the, our graduate students. 
<laughs> Come on, Kelsey, go for it. Individuals I've chatted with certainly are eager to do such things, yes, as individuals speaking. This national dialogue uh, is one of the things that it is trying to achieve. Uh, definitely, um, you know, in the end, we have to come to terms, right? Peace and reconciliation is the only way out. Um, so, yeah. Single breath. Yes, yes, you can. I just want to say to you, just you know, address the elephant in the room because there were like you know people saying is it genocide, is ethnic cleansing, or what is going on? And yeah, I would like to hear what you have to say. Um, I think thank, thank you. Um, we we should not and by any means use the word genocide lightly. First, how did it start? The war started in November, two thousand. 2020, right? Within a week, the aggressors themselves, the TPLF, and their um, benefactors and folks who are transplanted into international organizations, including here in Washington, DC, started to use this genocide. So I think if after a credible and proven investigation, whatever the legal definition of genocide, right, has happened, definitely those who committed that has to account. There's no way around it. But I will tell you that is part of the misinformation and disinformation campaign, right? Um, you know, some are created intentionally to sensitize the West, the international community, they just throw genocide, right? Um, so I think my personal take is different. Um, yes, people have died. It's an active war, right? Uh, the Ethiopian National Defense Force, you know, exercised maximum restraint. This is not my thing. You know, you can <laughs> look at how much, you know, the war, you know, for example, water, shelter, or what have you, Peter alluded earlier. You know, when the TPLF is fleeing to the mountain and the Ethiopian army is marching to the capital of Tigray, Nakali, they destroyed bridges, airports, telecommunication, and what have you. They themselves. When the transitional, the interim administration was set up, do you know, for example, the TPLA, when they came back to, after the government withdrew, and when they came back to Makale, they killed more than, this is documented and it's true. 25 Tigrans who worked in the interim administration 
with a pretext that you have helped the Ethiopian government, right? So I think, you know, we have to see it squarely. We have to, you know, note what the TPLF has also done. So I think moving forward, obviously, uh, the, the peace and reconciliation, um, the diplomatic and political solution is the only way out. And I think, um, I, I, I don't know, but the genocide, yes, there are crimes in war, uh, war crimes, I can buy that um, in both sides. Um, you know, the Ethiopian Human Rights Council in, con in conjunction with the UN Human Rights Council, they conducted a joint investigation, a very powerful you know, document. Michel Bachelet from Switzerland commented on that. It's a joint, very credible. And she said the art report, the findings in one word is for all parties committed war crimes. So it's, you know, this is where I think we need to focus. That bill, for example, it's not helpful. If we want to advance peace and, <laughs> um, you know, reconciliation, it's not helpful. You see, um, that is for another day, regardless. Um, I think um, the genocide thing is just, you know, people, I, it pains me, honestly. People have died, uh, but Tamila, can you just help us understand how do can we access uh, genuine news? Because you're telling us about yeah. all these, you know, media sources that we have access out here in the West who have some sort of misinformation. misinformation. Where do you get your news? Because we don't have, you know, Ethiopians that we can yeah, just yeah, call yeah. and say. Tell me what's going on there. Honestly, this is something that I can go on for hours, my information science background. Um, so I know how information is being generated and diffused and communicated and it gets viral. Uh, for example, I think you see authority and evaluating information is key, right? Authoritative sources. For example, Amnesty International, right the week of November when the war started, they have investigated and you know reported on a mass killings in a town called India, Western Tigray, Mykadra. Over 600 you know, farm laborers of Amhara descent in Western Tigray were murdered brutally by a group called Samri. This is according to Amnesty International. And now, while we have that now, the the, the new report they you know uh, they produced uh, and they made it public this last week, the Amnesty and Human Rights Watch together. What they are saying is they are reversing. Uh, those people died because of there is this opportunistic looting by the laborers going to the Tigran businesses. You see how things are being distorted. And so I think, you know, how I get my sources, you know, I read from east, east to west. Mm -hmm. For those of you who may not know me well, I started my work in, in libraries. So I read, you know, Sputnik, Reader's Digest, or New York Times, or Moscow Times, or all sources, foreign history, foreign policy, international affairs, what have you. So I think it is when you do that, you get a balanced view, right? So otherwise, I think what I have very serious concerns and doubts for all of us really as you know, upcoming, uh, especially students, uh, professionals, uh, we shouldn't really just go be swayed with one perspective, right? We have to, okay, put it to question and look at other sources um, so including the, the, the Ethiopian Human Rights Council, now led by Dr. Daniel, who was prosecuted, who was in jail, thrown into jail by TPLF. And uh, he's now doing amazing, amazing job, criticizing the government itself. And um, so I think the report they are generating, they are expo exposing all the wrongdoings still today. And I think we need to, see all sources, obviously, um, you know, even if as much as I don't like CNN or 
uh, these mainstream medias. I do read uh, just to get a perspective. I think uh, your question was uh, very on target, Singunde, and your point about the elephant in the room, genocide could be the elephant, the term genocide could be the elephant in the room. Uh, that's why I use ethnocide to label genocide. It takes a great, as Shamelis is suggesting also, be very careful in using that term. Absolutely, we have to be. I think it's ethnocide. Have TPLF troops harmed other people? Absolutely, absolutely they have, including Amhara people and Afar people. There's no doubt about it. But the greater question is for Tigray as a whole, what about the displacement? What about the food insecurity? What about the refugees? What about the fact that people have been killed? The women have been raped. I've talked to two people whose family members were raped. The point is that in a broader sense to me, reflects ethnocide targeted against a particular people by virtue of their ethnicity, not that you intend to necessarily wipe them all out, but you're targeting in part and in large part because of their ethnicity and what that represents to you, the aggressors. So have there been atrocities on both sides? Absolutely. But in my view, to address the elephant in the room, it's best to use the term ethnocide. Thank you, Peter. Any other questions? No? Okay. All right. Um, I wanted to pick up on the issue of reconciliation. I think that um, with what has happened, it's almost uh, impossible for the country to go on. And so reconciliation, and particularly um, a Kelsey suggestion about the truth and reconciliation committee, if we could have something like that, that would be very helpful, particularly just to, because of the divisions that have taken place in the country and for people to be able to come to the table and to look each other in the eye, to say they're sorry and they mean it and they, you know, make commitments to do good and to live in harmony because the tensions are really very high because we try to have this panel to, uh, in, in last quarter, and we tried to invite uh, Ethiopians. We had, you know, a lot of tensions flying. People who were supporting the TPLF and people who were supporting the government. It was, I we felt it was not going to be a useful discussion. So if we can have tensions like that out here in Denver, I cannot imagine the tensions that are there in Addis and even mm -hmm. just in the Tigray region. And so I am hoping that. It is something that will take place. I'm, I'm not sure if you have anything that you've heard, uh, particularly with uh, having a truth and reconciliation process. Um, nothing of concrete in nature, really, but the National Dialogue Commission is the only thing that I see is in the works. Uh, so, but I think, you know, by way of final remark, um, absolutely, this very polarized situation has to dissolve in one way or another. Otherwise, the future of the country is at stake and uh, the country finds itself at a crossroad. Uh, that is without exaggeration. Um, everybody has to stay back <laughs> and you know, what is in the best interest of the people, the poor. You nicely put it, you know, when two elephants are fighting, it is a grass that is being hurt. So I think, but we have to also understand this ethnocized, to a degree, I do not agree. The defense, the Ministry of Defense, who, do you know the, the Minister of Defense? It's a Tigrayan. The Health Minister is a Tigrayan. There are hundreds of thousands of Tigrayans still in Addis and in other parts of Ethiopia. It's not that, you know, people went into the Tigray business and they did something bad in the rest of the country. No, people are still living together. But the TPLF is held bent on you know, removing the Abbey administration. Regime change was the goal, whether you, you agree or not, by the West. And that was in full, you know, display, this last fall. It was. And why would we, do we want to promote that? So I think what is not helping is my beginning remark, 
why did the TPLF go on in a killing rampage of those innocent people who defended them, who married and are living there, right? Why would they do that? They themselves admitted the next day it is a thunderous attack. They wanted to loot all the armament, 80% or 75% of the Ethiopian weaponry and the armament was stationed there because of the war with Eritrea. Mm -hmm. They wanted to take that and march to Addis and because it's Ayas and come back to their dominance. Mm -hmm. Sim plain and simple. That, that was, again, now I think they have to, you know, abandon that strategy. The government should be tolerant enough also to accommodate all warring factions including the OLA, the Oromo Liberation Army, where Abiy draws its support in huge number. He's an Oromo himself, right? Thank you. Uh, yeah. I hope he doesn't have his final remarks. Okay. <laughs> well, I think it's been a very good session. I've enjoyed being a part of it. We have agreements, we have disagreements in challenging environments, that's appropriate. I enjoyed working with both my co-panelists, Abby and Shamelis and appreciated the comments from you good folks. Um, again, have to move toward reconciliation in an informal way and in a formal way, national dialogue involving folks, both formal and informal decision makers, essential from multiple groups. And we can't just, again, remember the major ethnic groups. I've reminded you of the minor tribal groups, also equally important in Ethiopia. We want to make sure those folks, both men and women, have a say. and. Um, Finally, I'll just say, we got to continue to support the opening of humanitarian corridors to continue to get supplies to bereft people and people who are struggling, including people struggling without adequate water and without adequate food in Tigray. The use of humanitarian corridors, which I also mentioned in the Denver Post several months ago in an article there, is absolutely essential. Those corridors have been very difficult to open and maintain. And I attribute that problem to all parties who have not come forward as adequately as they could to secure humanitarian quarters. Nonetheless, some of you know me, some of you know me like Hyder for 40 years. Am I a guy whose cup is half empty or am I a guy Hyder whose cup is half full? You know, it's half full, you know that. I'm an optimist, we can, we can do this and our Ethiopian friends will be the better and it will all be the better, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Thank you all for coming. This has been very helpful. At least I have found it helpful to process, you know, the different things that are happening on the ground. And I hope it was helpful for you too and informative. And have a lovely afternoon and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much.